Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. My name is Salima Hankins, and I direct the UN Anti-Racism Coalition. Um, I co-facilitate this uh, the coalition along with Lamar Bailey. Um, I want to say welcome um, to our event. This is um, a side event to the Human Rights Council Session 51. Um, and of course, this event is focused on systemic racism in the context of police violence. A little bit about the coalition, the UN Anti-Racism Coalition is a global coalition organized in the wake of the killing of George Floyd. It centers the voices of black advocates from around the world working on police violence and systemic racism, either um, nationally, internationally, locally, and in, in their own communities. Um, a coalition's work is to support the effective implementation of the resolution that created this a new mechanism that focuses on police violence and systemic racism. You will hear a little bit more about that later in the event and also hear from one of the experts of that new mechanism. Um, and it really is our focus to make sure that we are um, centering the voices of advocates whose um, voices might be silenced or who you may not necessarily hear from or who, who don't have access to UN spaces. So um, welcome. I want to now pass it over to our moderator, Ajum DK. Um, she is a human rights and social policy advocate with over 20 years of experience in the field. She has extensive experience building literacy and using human rights laws and mechanisms, particularly at the United Nations for grassroots advocates and has worked with groups in the United States and globally. Thank you. Thank you, Salima, and thank you, Lamar. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this uh, today, uh, morning, afternoon, wherever you are joining us from. I'm delighted to be moderating this session for the UN Anti-Racism Coalition, um, of which I am a member. Um, and as Salima just said, this event is, this side event is really meant to inform a framework um, on how we can advance justice for communities that are directly impacted uh, by police and state violence, and specifically uh, African and African descendant, Afro-descendant communities. So to start us off, let's just talk a little bit about what we're hoping to accomplish today. Um, one is we're hoping that by the end of this event, you will have uh, an understanding, a deeper understanding of what systemic racism means, um, particularly through the lens of the August panel that we have today. Um, secondly, we want to discuss systemic racism as it impacts communities on the ground, people on the ground. Again, people of African descent and Africans, and then the third aim of this panel is for us to think through how we can best use these mechanisms, particularly UN mechanisms, but we also have a regional mechanism um, represented today in advancing justice and how best civil society can engage with these mechanisms. All right. So let me start off with a basic uh, definition of systemic racism. Um, and then after that, our panelists will all be uh, giving us some more insight into what it means uh, in their different communities. The concept of systemic racism is really important because it's understood as the operation of a complex and interrelated set of laws, policies, practices, and attitudes that not only um, that we not only find in state institutions, but also in the private sector and in societal um, structures, societal structures. And we're looking at systemic racism as opposed to looking at racism as the sum of individualized acts of racism. So this is an important shift um, to look at it in this systemic interrelated way. Um, and we know that the impact of systemic racism is really to exclude and marginalize people of African descent and Africans 
uh, resulting in our exploitation and unequal access to opportunities, to resources, to justice, and to power. And so to discuss how this plays out on the ground and how we can use UN mechanisms to advance justice for communities of African descent and Africans, uh, we have an amazing group um, of speakers today both representing, oh, well, all representing communities from around the world. Um, some of our speakers also represent uh, UN or regional human rights mechanisms. And so we have, um, because we have a lot of speakers today, as we said, we will be trying to keep the timing tight uh, to about eight minutes per speaker. I'll have a question. For speak, and then we're asking people to put their questions in the chat. Um, it's likely that we will not have time to answer the questions, but um, put your questions in the chat. And what we are committing to do is to come back to you with responses after the event, should we run out of time today. All right. So without further ado, let's start, uh, turn it over to our panelists, our first panelist is Maria Silva, who is a transgender professor and human rights activist from Brazil. And uh, Maria, we know that a lot of lot is happening in Brazil at the moment, um, including I think I just I think I just heard that uh, uh, the first transgender elected official um, or first transgender person won elected office recently. So maybe um, you've heard about that as well. In any case, what we are hoping you can talk to us about is to really think through what, what are the structural problems that are faced by Africans and Afro-descendant people? And how does, it, how does this impact people on the ground? Thank Maria. You very, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. I would like to apologize for my English. That's not the best. I'm going to give my best to make myself understandable for you can understand oh, me. Oh, um, your sound went off, Maria. Oh, really? Oh, better, better. Okay. Um, let me know if you can't hear me because I, I'm not sure what's going on. Anyway, um, I would like to, to start by, by thanking for the space and greeting the colleagues in this panel. I met Gay in, in, in Geneva a couple of weeks ago. Um, it seems to me, actually, to answer your questions, a very good starting point by the fact that racism promotes a delusional, a tyrannical, and yet profoundly homogeneous dimension. Uh, that promotes the reduction of black body uh, and, and the living being to a matter of appearance, skin, or color. The idea of race has been in, in the imagination of European societies since the moment of the first organized spoliation that began in the 15th century, uh, which we call colonialism. Colonialism left deep to wounds uh, for our societies and economic development that we currently have to deal with. Uh, it produced the maintenance of fear, horror, poverty, devastation, destruction, death in an asymmetrical and racially biased way in the south half of the planet. The racial terror invented by this model of economic management which subjugate every living group in this planet has been reinforcing the notion, for example, of frontier and increase in brutality as a fundamental fact of our times. Borders are no longer places that cross it, but lines that separate, divide, classify, stigmatize persons around the world. This brutality, which reflects a substantial difference between peoples, and which has apparently been divi dividing the world into two halves that do not complement each other, but become a coextension in space of war, hunger, disease, contempt, 
and the management of the most various hate policies. Uh, I think hate, racism is not a, a momentary act or action, but uh, the dimension that defines the processes of organizations of societies through the subordinations of certain groups of or social strata that are racially identified, producing the most varied forms of violence, differentiation, and objection. Racism defines, strictly speak, speaking, the model of justice and access to justice that organize the institution, the moral and religious layers, the social and human relationship aspects that make our society intelligible spaces. Racism takes for itself the economic flows that distinguish persons, territories, gender, class, which created and gave and gave birth to slavery and the poverty that still haunts us today and rose the fact we have to face in all areas of our existence. In Brazil and in the world, for example, racism is the fundamental line between humans and the reverse of humanity. It is the key and the main genie of police operations in favela that have generated more and more death of black children or young people. In my country, racism is the pandemic that, that fuels mass incarceration, food insecurity, poverty, lack of education, death. Two out of three people arrested are black. 70% of people who go hungry are black. 78% of people killed by firearms are black. During the pandemic, we saw that uh, uh, Black people died twice as often as non-Blacks. 71% of the young people who drop out of the school are Black. In terms of gender, 80% of transgender people murdered in Brazil are Black. Two out of three women killed in Brazil are Black. Qui sont assassinés. Okay. I think I'm hearing what, the transition. In, one in, of the interpreters is uh, muted, I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, one of the interpreters is in the main channel. I believe it's the French. So if you could if you could please go back to the French channel. Right now you're speaking in the main room. Thank you. Est-ce que vous pouvez m'écouter dans le channel du français? Yes. Uh, we can hear you. So if you can yeah. go to the French channel, we can hear you in the main room. That's that, that's okay. Je ne parle pas français, but 57% of cisgender women raped in Brazil are black. So we have a big issue uh, uh, in terms of racial uh, actions we, we should take and we should fight. For. Uh, for women, racism and race have created the most terrible policies and impacted directly. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll tell you right now. Uh, can, I, can I go uh, on? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Paraît-il uh, que je suis hors de la salle? Oh, uh, one second, I'm sorry. Okay. I humbly apologize. Yeah, Mikel, uh, yeah, so you should be muted right now. There's some. Yeah, thank you. Let's go on. Thank you. Okay, no worries. As I was saying, I think in terms of it, it, racism presents for uh, put women in particular risk, I would say. Uh, for example, when we have to take a look into income distribution, to give you an, an idea, Black trans woman in the favelas in Brazil survives with a monthly income of approximately $17. Uh, it means that these women are uh, uh, below the, the extreme poverty. Um, racism is the mother and father of ills in our time. Uh, it impacts on infrastructure, access to water and sanitation, hunger, access to labor, housing, migration, police violence, sexual violence, destruction of environment, deforestation, and I could name a lot of horrible things that it promotes. So in, this fa in the face of this scenario, what could be done? What could we do? 
I think uh, it's important to adopt more severe measures to punish racism in all spheres of power, making people, company, and mainly institutions that commit racist act even more responsible. Second, I think it's important to create measures to control the police force and end the militarization of police, uh, uh, mainly in Latin America and in Brazil. Um, and finally, because I think my time is just getting to the end, create a permanent lines of funding for anti-racist education in most varied areas with uh, the goal of promoting racial justice and repairing the legacy of the colonialism and all its impacts, offering opportunities and expanding the social participation of black women in particular, and especially transgender women uh, in a space of decision-making. We can actually build a future without racism, but we have to, to take it in an intersectional approach and act right now. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Silva. Um, we appreciate that. You know, one of the things you mentioned was the need to hold people in power accountable and have more severe re, um, or, um, yes, responses to racism and systemic racism. So on that note, you know, one of the things we often think about is when we think about systemic racism is that the people in power um, particularly racism against people, Africans and people of African descent is that people in power are not also African or, or people of African descent. And so um, to think about that question a little bit more, I'd like to invite you, Cheryl Das, um, to speak a little bit. Um, Cheryl Das is the regional director of an amazing organization, the Legal Resources Center in South Africa. So could you speak a little bit to that. In other words, can structural and systemic racism against people of African descent exist in places where people of African descent or Africans are in power? Thanks, Adrian. And um, I think I can answer that question in two words. Absolutely, yes. Um, but let me tell you why. Um, you know, structural racism and systemic racism in South Africa um, like what like Maria stated in, a, in, in, in the previous session, um, has its roots both in, well, for us, British and settler colonization, with, with settler colonization giving birth to the apartheid regime that served to center control and power in the hands of the white Afrikaner minority. So in its simplest sense, structural and systemic racism should therefore be viewed at least in the South African context as a consequence and a system or a symptom of the structures and false narratives developed by our British and Dutch colonizers um, who laid the foundations for the apartheid government to maintain control and entrench power over the black majority and legitimize white supremacy. So Afrikaner supremacy and the dehumanizing of black people were carefully embedded in laws and policies and institutionalized in structures that were responsible for enforcing and policing them. So policing under apartheid rule was focused on maintaining control and preventing an insurgency by the black majority, um, eliminating dissidents and policing apartheid laws and central to legitimizing their God-given right of supremacy over people of color, the apartheid government institutionalized false narratives around black persons they created an institutionalized racist identity, putting people of color against each other by determining which race was worthy of limited rights whilst upholding the superiority of the white race. So in that context, policing and you know, police training, combat training, weapons training, and in general, policing structures and systems were designed to dehumanize black people. Um, so these structures and systems of oppression that have been, you know, they haven't been meaningfully decolonized, but they have been repurposed to suit the agenda of the post-1994 government, governed since then by the ANC. 
So whilst attempts were made at the outset to demilitarize, for example, the South African police force, institutionalized racism in policing, designed and constructed by colonialism and, apart and the apartheid government, remains unchanged. So in 1995, for example, the ANC moved to reform the police force from a paramilitary force to a civilian police service. They did away with military ranks and changed its designation from the South African police force to the South African police services. So a lot of us felt that it was a you know, it thought that it was a positive change and it seemed at face value to move towards community policing. However, in reality, police training, the operating procedures, the rules of engagement remained highly militarized and there was an absence of political will. Um, and I think intentionally an absence of political will to dismantle oppressive structures um, and institutionalize racism, particularly within the police force. So like so many of our democratic reforms, these reforms were just band-aid interventions um, with the police largely serving to protect the state and political interests by using force um, to stifle dissent rather than upholding a constitutional mandate to protect and serve its people. Interestingly, the ANC government in 2010 reverted back to military rank. And, and this after the deputy minister of police stated that he wanted the police service to be tr transformed back into a paramilitary force with military ranks and discipline. And both the minister and his deputy felt that, you know, the current police service was an object of ridicule and garnered no public respect. So there are various instances that I can mention where the current government has repurposed structural systems of oppression. The mandate of the police force and their purpose under democratic rule has largely remained unchanged. Um, the most striking example I can give you is the killing of 34 striking miners by members of the police force at the Lonman mine at Marikana on the 16th of August in 2012. This was indicative of the notion that the state, business and political interests play a major role in policing. The Marikana massacre caused shockwaves in South Africa and abroad and brought to the fore what many activists have believed that the police force is still being used as an agent of oppression. Um, and the sequence of events actually leading up to the killing of these miners is particularly interesting. Insofar, it, insofar as it alludes to some sort of political influence in the use of the police to control what was essentially a wage dispute between a mining company and its workers. And, and these, are, these events were documented in evidence before the Marikana Commission of Inquiry. And one of the findings um, at the commission said that you know, to some extent, political influence in how the police dealt with the mining, um, uh, stri uh, mining striking workers were actually present. The commission found, for example, that you know, over the 14th and 15th um, of August, the police tried to actually negotiate uh, and resolve the issue between the striking miners and the mining company. But police members involved in the negotiations were, as, were actually undermined by their own provincial commissioner who actively discouraged Lonman from negotiating um, with the strikers. And as a result of this interference um, in trying to receive, uh, you know, in, in trying to achieve a successful peaceful resolution, um, the police were actively um, uh, uh, thwarted by the acts of or by political influence. Additionally, the commission also found that political influence may have played a very vital role in the instructions given to the police to use force to disarm the striking miners. But the Marikana incident is not the only instance where the state has used excessive violence to protect mining interests at the expense of poor and black people. The state has also used excessive force against poor and black people who challenge the state's inability to provide basic services such as housing, sanitation, water, and uh, to mainly poor and black, black people. Of these pe often these people are criminalized for occupying state-owned land to set up informal housing structures, often labeling them as land invaders or land grabbers and creating false narratives about who's responsible for their discontent. And, and often deflecting the state's culpability on non-nationals of African descent. Um, brutal evictions in South Africa of poor and black people who occupy state-owned land 
and the destruction of their rudimentary shacks is reminiscent of apartheid style forced removal. Uh, so civil disobedience under apartheid rule was regarded as a crime. And under this new dispensation is deemed to be treasonous, warranting the full might of the police force. So violent police action against poor and black people in these circumstances demonstrates that institutionalized racism and the dehumanizing of black people under the new democratic regime has not been meaningfully eradicated. African leaders are therefore not immune to repurposing structures and systems that oppress black people or reinforce structural racism to suit their own agenda. It is also not common and is not only relevant to South Africa, but to most African led states. But I must qualify this by saying that power lies not with those who wear the crown jewel, but those who own the crown jewel. So whilst the ANC led government may lack political will to reform institutionalized racism in policing, for example, big business plays a significant role in influencing African leaders to maintain the status quo. So, you know, where to from now? And, and, and how can the mechanism um, assist in this regard? Um, my belief is that the, the, the expert mechanism must therefore apply pressure through their mandate to ensure that African leaders are held accountable for their failures to implement meaningful structural reforms to advance racial justice. While South Africa, you know, has a has a high functioning judiciary with a constitutional court being the gatekeeper of all human rights, many African states are not as fortunate. Most Africans also do not have access to regional mechanisms to hold states accountable for human rights violations and racial discrimination. Only eight out of 33 African states have submitted to the jurisdiction of the African Court for Human Rights, South Africa not being one of them. So the expert mechanism therefore becomes all the more important to hold African states accountable for failing to dismantle structural and systematic racism. Lastly, I just wanna say that in terms of the recent reports, the August 22 reports, both by the UN United Nations High Commissioner for, Refuge, for Human Rights and the expert mechanism, at first glance seems to focus, focus on people of African descent and not Africans. Um, and while the promotion and protection of human rights of people of African descent against excessive use of force is and will be a matter that requires urgent remedial action by the expert mechanism, African-led states cannot and should not be given a cursory glance. The expert mechanism must ensure that African states and big businesses who actually exercise de facto control over African leaders are held to account. Um, and I'm going to leave it with a question for the expert mechanism about what are the next steps in this regard and what are the concrete recommendations will they be making to advance transformative changes in racial injustice and inequality, not just for people of African descent, but for African people. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> You're leaving us with so many questions. I wish we had more time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we will definitely be raising one of the questions on, you know, what are the next steps um, for the expert mechanism on racial just and advancing racial justice and um, equality in law enforcement, which is the expert mechanism that Cheryl was referencing. Um, we will be talking a little bit more about that later. All right. So, you know, one of the points. Um, that Cheryl Das just made, and um, that was also made by Maria, is how these uh, systems of oppression, particularly law enforcement, are really vestiges of colonial powers um, and imperial powers, as you see uh, playing out in the Americas. Uh, the uh, in fact, the creation of the United Nations and the adoption of key human rights mechanisms had to grapple with some of these tensions, having leaders in of the imperial world, if you will, um, and uh, colonial world um, being some of the primary ach architects of the United Nations. Um, but we've also seen that civil society and in fact, newly um, countries, particularly 
in Africa who really liberated themselves from colonialism were instrumental in the adoption of some key human rights um, instruments, including the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. And so for that, um, I am thrilled to move on to uh, Gay McDougall, just a venerable leader in, in human rights. Gay is a member of the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, uh, the CERD Committee. Um, and she was also the first independent expert on minority issues. And Gay, I know you, um, prior to rejoining CERD, were really instrumental in the advocacy around getting MLAR, the MLAR mechanism, the expert mechanism, um, passed or come to come into existence. Um, so I have two questions for you. One is, could you just talk a little bit about how CERD addresses the issue of um, systemic racism? And um, as a follow up to that, if you could also talk about how um, the work of this new expert mechanism can be, uh, is complemented or can complement the work of CERT. Well, um, it's a, thank you very much for the introduction. And I'm uh, very happy to join this uh, really fascinating panel uh, discussion today. Uh, since I only have eight minutes, let me move quickly. Uh, in CERD, we, uh, first of all, focus on the wording of our treaty, the International Convention uh, Against Racial Discrimination, which uses the terms in the definition of racial discrimination by purpose or effect uh, to make clear that discrimination manifests in intentional and non-intentional impacts. Um, it goes far broader than individual biases to infect the structures of society, uh, causing inequalities that become pervasive throughout institutions and throughout uh, society. Uh, but let me focus on a couple of uh, uh, times that we have uh, uh, had a discussion about structural and, and systemic racism uh, in recent uh, years. Um, we just did a review of racism, racial discrimination in the United States. We did that in August, this past August, 2020. Um, and we uh, uh, said in our concluding observations uh, that, uh, uh, which highlighted the pervasiveness of systemic racism in the United States. Uh, we called on the U.S. to, in quote, adopt national action plan to combat racism uh, and structural racism uh, and discrimination in a coherent and comprehensive manner. Uh, we noted how systemic racism has uh, prevented women of color, migrant women, indigenous women, uh, from accessing uh, sexual and reproductive health services, uh, for example, uh, causing a higher rate in those uh, uh, groups of mortality and morbidity. Uh, we express concern over uh, the high degree of residential uh, racial segregation um, and uh, the persistence of discrimination and access to housing on the grounds of race, color, et cetera, uh, due to discriminatory mortgage lending practices by private actors and exclusionary zoning laws that disproportionately affect racial minorities. Uh, we also, in uh, a separate uh, session, considered um, uh, the thematic, we had a thematic discussion on racial discrimination and the right to health. Uh, and this will lead to a, a, a general recommendation uh, probably to be adopted uh, by the end of this year or early next year. 
but um, our thematic discussion on racial discrimination in the right to health focused on uh, structural and systemic uh, issues. It, it uh, we uh, started out by asking um, uh, stakeholders a number of questions um, about uh, how structural discrimination in healthcare uh, exists and how um, it impacts. Um, we, for example, um, asked, does the understanding of racial discrimination as social determinant of health encompass compounded health risks and harms arising from structural uh, discrimination. And we asked how structural uh, racial discrimination in health manifests in emerging technologies uh, that are becoming more and more key um, in uh, healthcare. Uh, let me give you another example. Um, we uh, recently adopted a general recommendations number 36 on racial profiling uh, by uh, law enforcement um, in which we address the systemic nature of racism in policing methods and criminal justice system as a whole. Uh, we explicitly stated that, <clears throat> quote, racial profiling is often uh, the result of well-established and unchallenged practices of public authorities and public institutions. Um, and we also focused on, uh, on uh, indirect discrimination against uh, persons of African descent through the use of facially race-neutral algorithmic profiling such as uh, automated artificial intelligence tools. Um, another example, uh, in uh, 2017, as many of you will remember, awful events in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, when white supremacists um, uh, marched through town uh, and uh, the, uh, it resulted in the death of a protester. And uh, we, in that case, issued a statement under our early warning urgent action procedure um, uh, in response to the white supremacist attack against uh, black, uh, 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 black people and uh, uh, marches, uh, saying that the government of the United States of America uh, must identify and take concrete actions to address root causes of prol and proliferation of such racist manifestations and thoroughly investigate uh, the phenomenon of racial discrimination targeting people of African descent, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we later also talked about uh, the uh, the rise of white supremacist violence, um, saying that it is vital that states, civil society organizations, social movements, uh, and activists devote renewed attention uh, to uh, the structural drivers of racial inequality, including, as recognized by the Durban Declaration, those rooted in the history and legacy of slavery uh, and colonialism. Those are just some uh, examples, recent examples of how we have cited, um, you know, uh, structural drivers of uh, racial inequality in a lot of areas, including healthcare, um, you know, the situation of women and um, uh, uh, reproductive rights issues, housing, uh, and, and, and other other areas. Thank, thank you, Gay. Um, you know, it seems it feels to me that yes, CERD is one of those uh, mechanisms that really has been looking or has looked as far as I've worked with the instrument um, at things structurally and systematically, and I'm really uh, or systemically, I should say. 
And I'm really excited to hear about the new general recommendation coming out on health, because as we know, um, health institutions are really an area that um, not only the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted, we needed to look more at as, as we saw in the US. And I think Shell also mentioned in South Africa, but really globally around um, issues of reproductive justice, maternal mortality, which I know you all dealt with um, on CERD as well. Um, so thank you very much. We, we, we appreciate those really concrete examples. Um, I wanna move now to talk a little bit about how civil society can engage uh, but did you have, let me interrupt, did you have a second question for me? I, I, I did, but you know, because of our time. Yeah, okay. I, um, <laughs> yes, I had a second question on Emla and how it complements, but what I'll do is see if we can't ask someone else to pick it up um, later. Okay, all right, great. But Bye. thank you so much, yes. Um, and just um, as a reminder, we were, we are holding questions until um, the panelists speak, um, all the panelists speak. And so for now, I wanna move to uh, Mireille, um, Mireille Fanon Mendez France, who is uh, another activist, uh, human rights leader um, who served on the, was a former chair of the UN Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent, is a founder, director of the France Fanon Foundation. And um, really, as I said, um, a member of that mechanism, of the UN mechanism, the uh, working group, was an activist. Um, similar to uh, Gay McDougall. So one of the questions we had for you, Mireille, is given all the work that you've done, both on mechanisms and outside of it, um, what you think is the best way for civil society to engage with these UN mechanisms in order to advance systemic racism, um, to advance or dismantling of systemic racism? Oh, and you're on mute. Mireille, can you unmute yourself? Good afternoon or good morning. It depends where you are. Yes. Uh, good to see you. Good to see you again, uh, Ejim. It's a long time. Same here. And, Same here. <laughs> and um, uh, I did not really uh, answer to your question because I think there is some uh, other issue more in more important, and but I would I would try to answer to your question, uh, taking into account the example of the decade for people of African descent. Uh, the decade was not uh, was uh, oh sorry for the translator. I will try to speak in English because I understand. Uh, Every panelist uh, is an uh, English speaker. But in any case, I need some help or uh, some wording missing. I will uh, ask you to help me. Uh, Sorry? Hi, um, this, this is for the interpreter. We can hear you in the main channel. So we need you to go to the um, the French channel. I think it's French English channel. I think. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the as you know, the decade is almost uh, ended in two years, or even less than two years, and uh, it was absolutely not what it has to be. Uh, the decade, in fact, uh, should have opened it the. The way for African uh, African descent and Africans, and uh, I appreciate appreciate uh, the the underlining of Cherry uh, about that. Uh, okay, African descent and Africans, rather than being a mechanism added 
to all the others to combat racism and which are provi uh, proving particularly ineffective. To energize a process based on decolonial combativity by giving them back a voice, voice to African and African descent that has been stolen from them, including by international institutions. And in this sense, I try to answer challenging the, U the UN. As the institution of the UN and the international community should have built the condition for a reciprocal dialogue on the problems that have led to the structural invisibilization of African descent and Africans in colonial forms that question both the coloniality of power, that of knowledge, but also that which keeps all racialized people in a zone of non-being in the periphery of the periphery. But dominated remains the unsurpassable mantra of the unilateral system that the UN has become, which has, in a way, given itself the objective of speaking about the people while forcing them not to engage in a dialogue for emancipation and liberation. It is clear that the UN system over the decade, because it's not the only decade uh, mentioning racism. Before Durban, there was three decades against racism. And with, with, with a decade for people of African descent, or for the, or, of course, it's uh, organizing around the racialization and rash, racialized system, and specifically structural racism. It's more important than systemic, because the structure of our system, imperialist, capitalist, uh, is based on enslavement and the capitalism is based on capitalism. And, uh, and uh, okay, anyway, you understand what I mean? Absolutely. Uh, um, but dominate remains, okay, sorry, it is clear that the UN system over the decades have been responsible for stifling, trivializing and standardizing the voice of the victim and in this sense, multilateral institution and state have become part of the problem. It is not from them that the liberation of black bodies through their recovered dignity will come. In the end, the decade became what Afro-descendant and African organization did not want, the sounding board for the liberal aspiration of the dominant ones where they were consult consulted from far and why to give a token of goodwill, but also to recover a few ideas without any ambition with regard to the challenges facing black bodies. It never became a process that would have allowed to transcend the obstacle. It was confined to a role of controlled action and limited to the framework set by the structure of the United Nations at the request and with the consent of the state. It should have allowed the inauguration of a reflection on a decolonial project in which states and international institutions would have favored exchanges based on dignity and the transfiguration of a trait out of fear of otherness into love of the human. Afro-descendant and Africans claim their humanity and to make community among other things. From a historical, political, and collective problematization of reparation as a process of disalienation and epistemological questioning on the maintenance in a zone of non-being of Afro-descendant and Africans, even if some of them benefit from the enlightenment 
defended by the capitalist system. And one of the best example, it's we are absolutely mute on what, as African descent and Africans, we are absolutely mute on what happened to Haiti. Haiti should have been during this uh, decade, should, should have been the most focused point of our concern. Because if Haiti is not free, and the, the, the occupation by the foreigner and specifically by US is not ended, we are concerned because this imperialist power is one of the problem of the problem is one of the problem of the perpetration of racist system. And it's for me it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's difficult to understand how, uh, such such a case of Haiti, such a concern of Haiti was not taken in charge by all African and African descent community. Saying in one voice, we want to see what, what can we do for Haiti, what we have to do, and to find a way by ourselves to, 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 to suggest, to propose, to suggest some uh, some solidarity with Haiti. Even that we did not uh, we did not show our show up our uh, solidarity in one voice. Of course, certain organizations have specific relation with Haiti, but as African descent and African community, international community, we don't have one voice saying we are in solidarity with Haiti. Mm. Mm. The yeah. international decade should have, should have built the condition for a commitment against structural racism and should have been the moment of reclaiming their humanity for the million of Afro descendants and Africans who are deprived of. All in all, these 10 years will have been stolen from all those who want to change the human meaning of the world, as have the years since the independence of many decolonized countries, the breathing of the racialized people after these 10 years has not become lighter. On the contrary, it has become heavier. We can say without betraying the hope of African and African descendant that the decolonial struggle is to act to reverse the project of misery and deaths that the capitalist, racist, and liberal system carry. Thanks. We still have the permanent forum for people of African descent, which will be officially launched next December. Let's not let ourselves be disposed of it. It must become our voice directed by our decolonial combativity. It is. It is for me it's the only thing I can say because I I, I found uh, this tenure very uh, desesperating. Yes. And uh, and um, I think as African descent and uh, Africans we did not do what we have to do. It's in other, in one word I could say how. Um, how we can uh, unit, unit our voice for our people against racism, structural racism, against uh, the, the colonial power, but also the, the colonial power, the colonial knowledge when we see how the history is, is, uh, is told. Uh, Yes, and I could, and and how it's impossible, and how we are not uh, unit also for reparation to ask reparation, and not reparation for individual, yes, but, uh, but reparation for people of African descent, for political African. reparation, collective reparation, collective. and not individual reparation. Okay, it is really. Um, it is really uh, desespering to, to see where we are now. And even when I began as expert, I found the moment more with hope than now. 
Yeah. And of course, well, and of course, there is a crisis. Of course, there is a crisis. We can explain everything. There is a war, Ukraine war, and, and all these uh, horrible things. But for for people of African descent and Africans, the situation is worse than before. And we have to understand if you don't decide voluntarily, politically, to unite our voice, we will never succeed to get the beginning of the eradication of structural racism because the system is founded on this structural racism. And Thank for <laughs> to continue to, to perpetuate this system, it needs, it, it needs to have some people to aid. And it is as the history, as the basis of this system is enslavement yes. in the mind of the people, it is always, always black people, black bodies who are the first victim of the aid. We have to understand that. Thank and the state you, for that are responsible. <laughs> The state yes. really as responsible. Sorry. Yes, no, I'm sorry to interrupt. You also, because I, I hear you and you what you have issued to us is a strong, strong call to action. That in fact, the international decade for people of African descent is about to end. It'll end December 2024. Um, and yes, we do not have much to show for it. And but we also, I heard you talk about. Uh, remind us that we now have also the permanent forum um, for people of African descent having its first meeting in December, um, as well as we have our existing mechanisms that we continue to work with and push, including the expert mechanism, which we'll talk a little bit more about, but you, we've heard you loud and clear. This is a call to action as civil society, we need to be, and as people, Africans and people of African descent, we need to come together and push. Um, and with that, I want to um, bring Urena Best into the conversation. Now, um, I just saw Urena, but I hope she can join us. So I'll introduce her role um, briefly. Urena Best is an expert for regional mechanism, the Organization of American States Working Group on the Protocol of San Salvador. And she's also an ex coordinator of the Ibero American Network of Indigenous and Afro descendant youth. Um, and so we're glad to have you, Urena. You've heard, hopefully, some of the uh, panelists really talk about the ways in which um, systemic racism plays out on the ground, how mechanisms have tried to tackle it, and then also just this call to action for civil society. Um, and so I, our question for you is, maybe you could talk a little bit about the role of regional bodies in addressing systemic racism. And you are on mute. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. I don't know if you can see me. Yes, we can see and okay. hear you. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. And as Mrs. Fanon says, good afternoon, good morning, depends on where you are. <laughs> okay, the role of the regional bodies in addressing systematic racism is really important. And it's been getting more relevant uh, the past years. I would like to speak uh, specifically how we work in the in our working group to uh, to share an, as a to set an example or to share an example of how we can take advantage of the possibilities of the faculties of the different uh, groups or bodies. So, for example, uh, we recommend uh, that the state to the state to take the principle of equ equality and non-discrimination in transversal manner. Every time we, we work in a report for every, every single state, we always address this aspect as a priority. Also, um, for us, it's really important to recommend 
the ratification of the different treaties. For example, um, the International American Convention, Convention Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, and Related Forms of Intolerance. But we also recommend to the states to ratify other treaties. So it's really important. We, we, we don't only work with the, with the inter-American system, but we also um, encourage the government and the state to uh, ratify all the all the the conventions and treaties related to discrimination race, racism and discrimination other important role is that we also generate important documentation or document such as guides for afro descendant this uh, the main goal of these uh, documents are help first the people in charge of this position to understand what is the role. A lot of people hold certain position, but they don't understand the relevance of certain topics. And racism, mainly in the, in the American continent, is really complex for the way it's developed in different states or different countries. So we try to bring a common language and common understanding to work in this, in this area. So it's, this is really important. But we don't only help the people that is in charge of certain position, but we also encourage the development of public policies that promote the economic, social, cultural, and then the envir environmental right for afro descendant of afro descendant people other thing that is really important and not only us but other uh, groups work is also to encourage the government of the state to work side by side with civil society this is really important because we do receive information from the government or from the states from the states but we also receive information from the civil society. So it's really positive when the state or the government allow the participation of civil society so we can have the similar information because sometimes we get completely different report about the same topics. And that uh, we have to uh, investigate, we have to do work deep, uh, try to investigate and get more information to address any recommendation. So it's really good when the state allow the participation of the civil society, more when it's racism, uh, race, racism and discrimination and other matter, it's really important to have a uh, both working together. And I really would like to share something more personal. Like is like in the working group of the protocol of San Salvador, I am the first Afro-descendant person to be part of the group. It's a very complex and difficult process to be to be to become part of the group. And but it's really important to try to have the diversity because even when we know it's about the color of the skin or the pigmentation that's gonna, going to guarantee the quality of the work is really important to have different perspective when we discuss and we when we try to create strategies to work and kind of you know try to evolve or push the agenda. So it's really complex. It's really complex when you work in, a, in a spaces where it's just you have just one person that is really connected to the topic. We know it's a technical, um, we need to provide technical reports and we need to be really objective, but it's the human factor is always gonna be important. So I think taking into account what um, Mrs. Fanon shared 
just here, it's really important that the civil society, that, that the civil society become more strategic, identify people that can participate in different roles in those group, in these groups, to guarantee that the diversity and the vision to work in this kind of um, spaces is gonna be um, is gonna be really diverse and it's gonna be really objective. So, other thing that is really important for the group that I think is is relevant is that different um, bodies are have the possibility to get invitation from the countries. So they can have visit, they can go to the places, they can connect with different group, they can also create alliance with other actors. So I think it's really important. The racism and, discrimina and discrimination is something, as I say, at least in America, is, is not a simple uh, topic. It's something that you need to uh, adapt and discuss for the reality and the culture of different countries, because it's different, we have different realities. And also the, the colonial uh, history and the past and the connection with this uh, important matter, sometimes make more difficult to develop or to address this topic. So I think we are just, in, at least in America, we are beginning to grow. We have uh, different guides during the COVID. The OAS developed different document. They have important allies that are working in the same direction. I think right now with the decade, we have an interesting moment. Moment is almost over. However, a lot of important things have been happening in the last seven years. So. I think, yes, we can keep working together. I think it's also important to consider have different exchange with the expert group from the OAS and the UN. I think that is something that we've been missing. And I think we need to find a moment to exchange experience, to connect, to share good practice. So I think it's, it's, we have a lot right now happening, but I think we can, we can take our moment or a little bit of time to try to create more productive and positive dynamic between different groups and to, to bring more positive impact to the people uh, in the world. Thank you so much, Urena. That, um, that was a um, great um, reminder, one that, um, the decade is not over and things have been happening, but we do have some time to um, continue to engage with and to engage more actively with the decade, um, reminded of what's happening in the Americas. And I know Mireille mentioned Haiti. Um, so that's just um, bringing that back into the conversation. Um, and then you talked about connecting the mechanisms at the regional level with the UN. That is definitely something that the anti UN anti-racism coalition um, is starting to do with this kind of event and that we hope to do more of with regional mechanisms around the world. Um, but on this question of colonial legacies, almost every panelist has mentioned it. Um, the, the fact that um, we continue systemic racism and the um, institutions that um, really represent and perpetrate um, institutionalized racism are all relinked in one way or another to the colonial and imperial legacies and the legacy of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, so we wanna talk, we wanna talk a little bit more about that. And for that, we invite uh, Mr. Dudu Dien, who was a former UN Special Rapporteur on Racism 
In fact, um, he was a rapporteur. I worked with him when he came to the United States on a fact-finding mission, I think um, maybe 2009. It was a, um, we worked in New York. I don't know if you remember. Um, I don't remember. Okay, wonderful. And um, he's also a chairperson of, uh, former chairperson of the UN Commission on, of Inquiry on Burundi. So, you know, we've, we know that historically speaking, these systems of oppression and in particular law enforcement, institutions of law enforcement um, really were created to reinforce capitalism and the powers of um, colonial and imperial countries. Given your breadth of knowledge and the work that you've done, um, how do you see these legacies continue to influence um, not just the um, not just your institutions like law enforcement, but also maybe if you could speak a little bit to how they play out even within the UN itself. Uh, thank you very much, um, Edgin. You hear me well? Yes. Okay, listen, uh, for, I would like really to suggest some concept and ideas to move ahead. Yes. Because as you know, there have been and there are still so many meetings on racism. And, uh, but we have to move. So my first point I would like to share with you, and I think it's important, is uh, to consider racism in a universal perspective first. It means that the racism anti-Black and, and anti-African should not be separated from the combat against, against anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and the indigenous people, etc. That is very important because they all share the deep root causes. And it is from this understanding that we can build solidarity up front. This is my first idea. My second suggestion is uh, to take into account what lesson we are going to draw from the post George Floyd direct killing. We have, we have two lessons we can draw from that. One, that racism kill, that racism is violence. It kills. It is not only because the concept of structural or systemic may hide the deeper reality of violence. Racism kill. This is a very important point. And the second lesson from the dust Floyd is the resilience of racism. It is still there after centuries of combat, etc. So these two lessons may help us to tackle or get deeper on the anti-black racism. As my third suggestion is in the combat we are going, we are engaged in. We have to take into account that the two pillars of the racism, anti-black, is silence and invisibility. The silence on the history of racism, what happened, what caused it, you, can, you don't find it in the books of history, silence. And invisibility of the victims. The victims are socially, culturally, politically invisible. So these are the two pillars. So how these pillars are structured and how we can fight against this pillar. I think we have to understand that there are three or four factors which explain the resilience of the racism anti-Black. The one, the first one, keep in mind that the uh, intellectual process of racism anti-black is the essentialization of skin color. And that essentialization of skin color, essentialization means linking the color to moral, intellectual, and the civilizational factors. To, to, to say that blackness means backwardness, uh, uncivilized, etc. That concept of essentialization is the intellectual, intellectual core of the construction of, of racism against black, which, as you know, and at this point, many people forget about it. 
there are two racism which have been the subject of very profound and large studies, publication, research, discourses. It is anti-Semitism because of an old one, but the racism against the black. The factor of color are struct uh, as structured. The Western societies since the 16th, 17th century, very profoundly. And it was based on scientific work construction, chronology, even measuring the crimes, whatever, social science and philosophical publications, education and cultural uh, uh, fabrications. So what I'm saying is that the racism into black has been the subject of a very profound and the massive construction. And this construction has impregnated the mind and the structure, not only first of the Western world who created it, but the empire and the colonies, they have dominated. They brought it as a legitimation of their domination. So this is why it is global. And it, it's very important to understand that, that process. So which means that Racism anti-Black is an ideological construction to legitimize the enslavement, the colonial domination, and the present day marginalization of Black people and African descent. It is uh, the ideological legitimation. So what made, what the front we have to confront now to combat it is the first one, deconstructing this construction, understanding that it is an intellectual, scientific, and socially construction, intellectually to understand the process. The second important point is to understand that the main aim of racism is to legitimize domination and exploitation. And that domination and exploitation is translated in the present day societies where, which are marked by the multiculturality. Most of our societies are composed of people from different color, different races, etc. And the old ideology has structured them very profoundly. So what to do about it? So my first suggestion is really to understand that there are three fronts now. As I say, the intellectual front, deconstructing racism to understand that it is not coming from the moon. It is a construction structure, very profound impregnating the society and the mind. The second uh, uh, front, very important is to understand that the, the uh, intellectual front, as I said, the political front. The political front because as you have seen in Europe and now many elsewhere, Political parties are, are gain are at the, at the door of power, extreme right parties. And at the core of that political platform is the issue of, of race. They, because they have now with immigration, with all the, the different extreme right movement. What, what I'm saying is that racism is nourishing political parties, which are in Western countries at the door of power. So the political combat is absolutely central to, to, to combat it. Now, another point that's very important to understand why the resilience against black people is so pregnant is that we are living in a neoliberalism economic system. The neoliberal economic system puts the market at the core of the societies and everything is regulated by the market. And it is exactly the neoliberal system is a, a, a translation, a modernization of the old ideology of slavery, exploitation, domination, materialism. This is, and the neoliberal system is very profoundly uh, structuring our society. So three fronts are left to us. Uh, one, I must say that I, I, I repeat the intellectual front, the legal front, because we have succeeded in getting international instruments, in legal instruments in the different countries, 
and, and socially organized. But we have also achieved successes. Yes. And one, one, uh, this is why I, my conclusion is, let us not consider the violence against uh, uh, racism now as the meaning that racism is increasing. No, racism is getting out of the wood. Racism is now confronted publicly, openly, and it cannot be hidden because the force of racism to be it, it to be hidden. So mm -hmm. this is the first success. The second one, let us implement the instrument we have approved got internationally. Yes. The convention, the Durban Declaration and the Program of Action. And lastly, the decade. And the result of the decade, as you know, is a forum of Afro-descent. This is a very important, a permanent forum is now created at the UN yes. of Afro-descent. Let us get racism as a central issue of that forum to, to move the whole a UN system. So in conclusion, what I would like to, 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 to share is that let us consider racism against the black. First, link to racism against other minorities like Jewish, Muslim, and whatever to create a front. Secondly, let us also understand that Af black, black and African communities have been fighting successfully internationally and nationally to deconstruct to structure the societies. And that I think things are changing. You see it in the composition mm -hmm. of governments, in the media, etc. So let us not put in our minds that it is there is nothing we can do against the lesson, mm -hmm. that lesson against the black is, but we are the fight which has been led by many people, many groups since centuries, is getting now, I think, strong success. We have to move it Absolutely. by using this instrument. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sudhudin. Um, absolutely. I think that um, the point you're making and the evidence of that um, is this permanent forum that we, um, after years, have finally gotten, as well as the expert mechanism on advancing racial justice um, and equality in law enforcement. Now, and you make another very important point. You make so many important points, but one I want to highlight as we transition to the next speaker is the idea that these, the ideologies, the intellectual, the political, the neoliberal project and construction of um, racial ideology is not only institutionalized in the West, if you will, but it's that ideology has spread and has been internalized <laughs> by former colonies around the world. Um, and I think that is very important. It links to something Cheryl said earlier about making sure that the next, um, that the expert mechanism, which we will focus on next, um, also discusses and holds African leaders accountable um, as we look at law enforcement institutions there as well. Now, as many of you know, um, the UN, so thank you, Dududin. Um, as many of you know, the UN Anti-Racism uh, Coalition, many of you on the call um, were really instrumental in pushing for the adoption of this new expert mechanism, which is really a unique mechanism for a number of reasons. Um, one, that it focuses specifically on Africans and people of African descent. It has investigative powers, it can go on country visits, and it really centers, it centers people who are directly impacted, uh, people of African descent and Africans who are directly impacted in a way that um, is really sets it apart. Now, the experts were appointed uh, last year, December of last year, recently released their first report uh, which focused primarily on data, um, the need for data collection, the segregation of data. They will be going on their first country visit um, to Sweden by, before the end of this year. Um, but they have a three-year mandate. That's two more years to go. And so we are delighted 
that uh, we have the chairperson of the expert mechanism to advance racial justice and equality in law enforcement joining us today, um, Yvonne Mohoro. And um, I don't know, Yvonne, are you with us? Can you hear us? Yvonne Mohoro? I can hear you clearly. Oh, okay, wonderful, yeah. wonderful. And Thank you, you for joining us. Um, you You're know, so yes, we were just talking about the first report that um, the expert mechanism has released and that you have your first country visit coming up. Yes. And you know, earlier on, uh, we were going to ask um, Gay McDougall about how Emler and complements other existing mechanisms. Um, so I guess my question for you is this, if you could tell us a little bit more about the mechanisms approach to addressing systemic and structural racism, and maybe if you have um, some thoughts on the question Cheryl raised about um, ensuring that African countries are also mm -hmm. held accountable. Yes. Thank you so much and um, for those questions, but particularly uh, grateful I am uh, in you guys uh, roping us in, you know, into these uh, discussions at this earlier stage of uh, the life of the mechanism. It is, uh, I think, very important as it has been indicated earlier that uh, we need to unite, you know, um, against racism. Uh, wherever it rears its head. Um, and I think it is only through our efforts, united efforts, that we will probably gain much uh, uh, leverage in dealing with the scourge. Now, indeed, you know, as everybody understands, the mechanism is not only mandated to address incidents of uh, police racism and uh, racist violence against Africans and people of African descent, we are specifically mandated to address structural and systemic racism because that is the more difficult part. As we all know, the structures tend to hide racism because it tends to be indirect. And it is for that reason that our first uh, report focuses on the need to collect disaggregated data because where the structures and systems hide, the numbers will show, the data will show. So that whenever we deal and confront member states with uh, questions of systemic and structural racism and race discrimination, it is important that these be visible so that we are all on the same page. It is very important. And uh, in our report, we actually urge member states to collect, analyze and publish data disaggregatedly. Because when we engage with them, we are required to engage in cooperation, understanding each other. You know, when we engage, we should know what we are talking about. However, we don't expect every country uh, uh, to have disaggregated data uh, and have made analysis with regard to these issues of police violence or use of uh, excessive force against Africans and people of African descent readily. The mechanism was, uh, the members of the mechanisms were appointed in December. As you say, we're going to have, uh, uh, we've just submitted our first report, which deals with data because we see data the collection of disaggregated data is opening the floor for our uh, engagements with uh, uh, 
these issues. We're going to have our first uh, country visit to Sweden. We would have loved to go elsewhere, but because our mandate also requires us to look into positive initiatives by countries to deal with uh, uh, a police violence against Africans and people of African descent or police racism. We, um, on our list, we went, uh, to, we are going to Sweden as one of the countries which was uh, uh, first in line to invite us to, for a visit. We have a list of countries, which uh, some of which we think, and we regard it as, very urgent to visit, but unfortunately we do not have uh, ready invitations right away. So the long and short of it is that the examination and the need to address systemic racism, structural too, is uh, very much part of our mandate. And uh, it is going to be particularly uh, with regard to country visits that you will, we will shift that focus on uh, examining the laws, the systems, the structures, official or formal structures of uh, particular countries with regard to uh, questions of racism, racial discrimination and inequality. Because as you know, if the systems say we are all equal before the law, our lived experience might tell us or might show something else. So it is important that when we engage, we engage with the understanding that it is not sufficient for systems and formal structures to declare equality, non-racism, anti-racism. It is important for systems to be accompanied with particular interventionist programs, practical, at a practical level, interventionist projects, programs that show the political will to change things for people on the ground. It is, as our mandate says, it is the lived experiences of people, in particular communities and victims of, uh, victims and their communities or families of racism, racial discrimination and inequality that will become very important in our work. So as we, engage with countries in our visits, we have all the time to match the systems with the lived experiences of people. In uh, uh, the engagement we're going to have with the Human Rights Council when we deliver our report, when we have that interactive engagement, we have uh, invited two uh, presenters who will present on their experiences, lived experiences with regard to questions of uh, racism and, and uh, race discrimination and uh, inequality uh, in the context of, of, of uh, uh, law enforcement, of course, and uh, the justice system generally. And we, it is the first time that this is done apparently, and uh, we have done that so that the Human Rights Council gets a direct voice from the ground about their lived experiences. Some countries have systems which declare that uh, laws and policies and systems and, and structures where it is um, declared that we are all equal before the law. And when we question about certain incidents which uh, demonstrate otherwise and require responses, 
the temptation is always to make reference to the laws, to the policies, to the systems, to the formal structures, which regard all as equal before the law. And for us, that is not the response that you require. We must engage countries rel relative to the real experiences of people. It is good to have laws and systems and policies and protocols which uh, regard people as equal. But it is important that they translate into actual everyday life experiences which regard people as equal, which treat people equally. So uh, structural systemic racism and its connection with colonialism, imperialism, and as my colleague earlier said, even apartheid systems, yeah. which are colonial like systems, oppressive, suppressive systems need to be examined so that the So that uh, the, 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 the gains, if you take South Africa, for example, the gains of the constitution must translate effectively in the lives of people. So it is not enough to have good laws, good systems, good policies that regard people as equal. The equality that people in people's lives must be substantive. Absolutely, absolutely. It is only when that is achieved, then we can say we're making progress. And uh, we'll have this opportunity in, in our country visits. And um, earlier it was uh, the, the, the role of civil society uh, uh, was uh, indicated to be very critical. In all our country visits, we will not only engage with the police authorities, we will engage with police at all levels, we will engage with uh, groups of uh, activists, including yeah. civil society. And uh, in fact, as soon as we had our first meeting in Geneva uh, uh, in February of this year, we immediately started connecting with civil society and we're going to do that with every country visit that we have. Very good. Engage with a cross section of stakeholders and our stakeholders are right from the authorities, political authorities, down to the police authorities, down to victims and communities which have experienced the police uh, 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 racism to civil society. And uh, it is important therefore for us to understand the nature of uh, racism, racial discrimination and inequality and how it impacts on people. And that what is important is that there must be a political will to deal effectively with racism. And it is when there is political will that we will have to require it to be demonstrated in the intervention systems which will be created to make the lives of uh, people on the ground real in the context of uh, anti-racism, racial equality, particularly in the context of um, law, law enforcement <clears throat> and, yeah. uh, and, 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 the, and the criminal justice system. 
Thank you so much, um, Eva Mahoro. We appreciate you making the time and hear you loud and clear. Um, uh, and the, you know what is unique about the mechanism is this making sure that we go beyond the jure equality, as you're saying, the equality in laws, and to make sure that in lived experiences, people are experiencing um, substantively equality. Um, we're looking forward um, to the next report. Um, you, you all have so much um, on your plate, and like I said, a lot to accomplish in a short amount of time but uh, an exciting and robust mandate. Um, and we look forward to engaging with you. And also, as you say, talking about political will, the fact that we need to, um, and as civil society, Mireille pointed to this as well, we need to force the political will of our states. Um, it will not happen, it has never happened otherwise. <laughs> so that is our own call to action as we move forward. Well, last but not least, we want to talk a little bit about um, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the work um, of that office in ensuring that the, uh, this expert mechanism, um, in supporting this expert me mechanism and supporting the human rights mechanisms that exist within the UN. Um, I was, you know, in rereading your report on the office of the high, from the office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, I love the I love the communications around, particularly around um, this issue of addressing systemic racism. You know, the fact step up, pursue justice, listen up, redress. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I love it. Uh, so with that, we are so happy to have Sarah Hamoud um, here with us. Um, Sarah is a human rights officer and coordinator of the racial justice team of the UN High Commissioner or Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. So Sarah, maybe you could start off by just explaining briefly the difference between the OHCHR and the expert mechanism and then we want to ask you about the issue of reparations. But after I'll wait, I'll hold that question until you just do the, explana the explanation on the difference between these two. Thank you. And I'd just like to start by acknowledging all the excellent interventions of, of the speakers before me. And I'm very happy to be here with you all. Um, I just want to zoom out because when we talk about the OHCHR mandate, of course, it's a global mandate to protect and promote human rights. Right. Um, and within that, we do um, really important work, I think, around uh, combating um, racism and racial discrimination. So there's um, the work that you mentioned in terms of our support, for example, to the UN anti-racism human rights me um, mechanisms. Uh, we support, you know, state led um, standard setting exercises like the, the current process of, of drafting a UN declaration on the promotion and respect of human rights of people of African descent. You know, we do things like uh, supporting states and, and other stakeholders on, on legislation, anti-discrimination legislation to try and make sure that, uh, you know, it, it, um, it complies with international human rights standards, that it's comprehensive and so on. Um, we, so we do many, many different things in that area of, um, of combating uh, racism and racial discrimination. But I think what you're getting at is really the, the, the kind of area of work um, that was in some ways the, the precursor, if you like, to the establishment of the, of the, um, of the expert mechanism. So since um, 2020, we've really deepened our research, our analysis and our reporting on, on systemic racism against Africans and people of African descent, uh, following that far reaching Human Rights Council resolution uh, 43-1. And um, we then you know, issued a report and a, a accompanying conference room paper, and we launched that agenda towards transformative change and for racial justice and equality that you alluded to, uh, Ejim, with those four uh, pillars, um, which is very much anchored in the lived experiences of Africans and people of African descent. And we feel really charts a kind of path to achieve transformative change through these 20 actionable recommendations. 
Um, now, the Human Rights Council then responded by, you know, adopting a second resolution that was 4721, and in that was the establishment of the expert mechanism um, that, that uh, Justice McGorrow was telling us about just a moment ago. And in that same resolution, um, you know, the Human Rights Council asked OHCHR to enhance and broaden our monitoring and reporting on systemic racism and, and related issues, um, and to provide support to states and others particularly people of African descent and their organizations um, to advance transformative change and to, to just to give uh, more visibility to this to this work. So kind of coming back to the heart of your your question, I think we really see those uh, the work of, uh, of our office in that area and the work of the expert mechanism and really the work of you know many of the other um, uh, anti-racism human rights, uh, mechanisms as being mutually reinforcing. You know, we talking about our work and the mechanism as, you know, just to get to your question directly, we're both, um, as we've heard from Justice McGorrow, and we're both striving to, to further transformative change, uh, to advance racial justice and equality for Africans and people of African descent, and to contribute to accountability and redress for, for victims. Um, we, you know, the, the, the mechanisms, um, particular lens is very much focused on the law enforcement and, and uh, criminal justice system, which we also look at as an office and we put it in the in the in the broader um, uh, picture, if you like, of um, other manifestations of systemic racism and the need to also listen to people of African descent uh, to um, to act upon their concerns and also to confront the past legacies. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of the, 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 the commonalities, if you like, I think, um, you know, uh, Justice McGurr also highlighted the, the lived experiences, the voices um, from the ground. And I think it's something that we have also taken, um, you know, very seriously as an approach to listen intently to Africans, to people of African descent, um, to, to better understand their, their, their lived experiences and then to reflect the solutions that they identify, the things that they say will work. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's been really important and also set, you know, it's kind of centering that in, in the work that we do, as well as taking um, you know, an, an, intersectional, an intersectional approach. Um, thinking about other things, you know, other aspects, I think we as an office will um, impress on states the, 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 the need to act on the recommendations of the various mechanisms, including this one. Um, and specifically, actually, the expert mechanism is tasked with monitoring the implementation of the recommendations on um, ending impunity for violations by law enforcement that we issued as an office as part of this agenda towards um, transformative change and identifying obstacles to their to their full implementation. So there's a lot of of complementarity there. And I'd just like to mention that you know um, we uh, OHCHR and the expert mechanism also present their reports jointly to the Human Rights Council. So um, next Monday, actually, um, the Acting High Commissioner will present the office's second report on racial justice and equality, um, which highlights the developments. Uh, that we've seen since the launch of the Agenda Towards Transformative Change that we issued last year, um, alongside Justice McGorrow, who will be um, presenting the first report of the expert mechanism. And as she mentioned, uh, there'll be also two um, really inspiring women of African descent who will be on the podium also uh, speaking um, and addressing the council and bringing their professional and their lived experiences into the dialogue. Uh, and that's also, that's available uh, for people who aren't able to access the council, it's available, you know, live on web, um, UN Web TV. Oh, so, wonderful! Um, and I can share the link after I finish speaking. So I think there's a, there's a there's a lot of complementarity. Uh, there's a that we we are seeing, you know, this strengthened anti-racism human rights architecture. We've we've heard about the permanent forum as well as another new addition. There are the long-standing mechanisms that have done so much, and it allows, I think, for a lot of um, entry points, a lot of, you know, pushing together in parallel, but together towards uh, towards um, similar aims, the same goals in the same direction. And hopefully that will will result in, in what we want to see, which is really tangible changes in people's lives. 
Absolutely. Thank you, um, Sarah. Now, unfortunately, as seems to be the theme today, we are running out of time. So I did not have the time to ask about your sec the second question, which was going to be on repertory justice reparations. I know you said in the report that no, no country had fully engaged on the issue of reparations, and that is an integral part of addressing systemic racism and the legacy of colonialism, uh, transatlantic slave trade, um, continued imperialism. Um, perhaps we can get to that another day. Before I hand off to our last, uh, to Salima Hankins, who will be closing us out, I just want to say a really heartfelt thank you to all the speakers um, for engaging with us, for sharing your knowledge with us, um, for agreeing to spend the time to talk about this really important issue on systemic uh, racism. I recognize that we haven't had time to answer the questions that you've all asked, and I've seen some really <laughs> good questions in the question and answer. Please rest assured that the coalition is taking note of the questions and we'll be responding to you via email. Um, and maybe we will be having a meeting in Haiti, who knows, IT. <laughs> um, we, have, we have some people, powerhouses on the call who can help us organize that. But um, in closing, just I will say thank you very much. It's been an honor speaking with all of you and I look forward to our continued conversation um, and handing it over to Salima. Thank you so much, Ajem. And I want to again extend, extend um, a thank you to Ajem and to all of the panelists, the um, translators and the attendees. I also want to take this time to thank the Open Society Foundation for their generous support of this coalition and also the Ford Foundation. And lastly, I want to mention the um, coalition uh, committee that actually organized this, the, the side event committee. And I want to mention folks by name just because of their hard work. So Kayo, Kayo Maraz, Jamil Dakwar, Salma El Husseini, Shaban Wills, uh, Ojeko Wambuzo, uh, Alejandro Lanz, Ana Barreto, and Ulysses Tertu. So thank you everyone so much for your uh, for attending and I hope to continue this conversation on. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to myself or um, to Lamar Bailey. Our information is on the flyer and you can check our website as well. Thank you. Have a good day, evening, everyone. <laughs>